We come today to 1 Kings chapter 14. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 1. At that time, Abijah, son of Jeroboam, became ill. Jeroboam, remember, was the ungodly, idolatrous king of the north. Remember, Israel split into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Jeroboam was the king of the north. He started the worship of golden calves. Last time we saw that God sent a prophet to announce his judgment. And what you see here with this son of his is just the beginning. And this Abijah was the son Jeroboam figured would succeed him as king. But he is sick. And this sickness is punishment for the idolatry which the king and his entire family was involved in. Verse 2, Jeroboam said to his wife, Go, disguise yourself, so you won't be recognized as the wife of Jeroboam. Then go to Shiloh. Ahijah the prophet is there, the one who told me I would be king over this people. So Jeroboam the king asked his wife to disguise herself so that nobody will know that she is connected to him. And he asked his wife to make this dangerous 30-mile journey to the prophet. And this prophet was the same one who years earlier had told Jeroboam that he would be the king of the ten northern tribes. Jeroboam didn't go and talk to that prophet himself. Probably was ashamed to. Probably understood that the prophet would not talk to him anyway since he was guilty of idolatry. So, Jeroboam, he is not in touch with God and his son is very ill. And I think one of the worst parts of unconfessed sins is that you cannot approach God. You're cut off. The king knows he's cut off from God, but still he will not repent. He comes up with this goofy idea to send his wife in disguise instead. Verse 3, Take ten loaves of bread with you, some cakes and a jar of honey, and go to him, go to the prophet. He will tell you what will happen to the boy. Well, Jeroboam, why don't you just go inquire at one of, with one of those priests that you established for your idolatrous religion? Notice that he didn't do that. Notice that he didn't trust the religious leaders that he put into office. Just a bunch of phonies, that's all, and he knew it. Phony religion is, it works pretty good when everything is going great. But when you're in a bind, then you need the real God and you know it. And when it was crunch time, Jeroboam even wanted a true man of God, not one of the phonies that he ordained for his false religion. Verse 4, So Jeroboam's wife did what she said, or what he said and went to Hahijah's house in Shiloh. Jeroboam and his wife were no good. But these parents, they were worried about their son nevertheless and both wanted a word from the true God. When life is hanging by a thread, people who have shunned God start looking for God. Some do anyway. And maybe most of them don't look to God with repentance in mind, but they certainly want help from the only one that they know can help them. Verse 5. Now Ahijah could not see his sight was gone because of his age. But the Lord had told Ahijah, Jeroboam's wife is coming to ask you about her son, for he is ill, and you are to give her such and such an answer. When she arrives, she will pretend to be someone else. Isn't this great? God is giving Ahijah the prophet all sorts of inside information. She is disguised, plus the prophet is blind, but he will know her because he is in touch with God. How foolish it is to try to trick God. Man's efforts are so pitiful compared to God's power. 
Verse 6. So when Ahijah heard the sound of her footsteps at the door, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why this pretense? I have been sent to you with bad news. She must have been shocked when he called her by name. She came to the prophet to learn what will happen to her son, and from what he said already, it sure doesn't sound good. Verse 6. So when Ahijah heard the sound of her footsteps, I'm sorry, verse 7, Go tell Jeroboam that this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I raised you up from among the people and made you a leader over my people Israel. The first thing that God says to Jeroboam is a reminder that he is the one who raised Jeroboam up. Jeroboam did not serve God. But God is still God over him. Whether he serves him or not, or not doesn't matter. God raised Jeroboam up and he is about to learn that God will bring him down. Verse 8. I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. But you have not been like my servant David who kept my commands and followed me with all his heart doing only what was right in my eyes. And there's God again talking up David. David the terrible sinner but David led, you know, loved God with his heart he did. He never turned his back on God. On the other hand, Solomon, his son, and now Jeroboam did turn their back on God with their idolatry. And that is why God turned his back on them. God never turns his back on anyone unless they turn their back on him first. 9. You have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made for yourself other gods idols made of metal. You have provoked me to anger and thrust me behind your back. He was worse, Jeroboam was worse than any other king before him. Worse than Solomon. Solomon, you know, he made worship centers for all sorts of false gods and that was bad enough. But this character made idols and then actually worshipped them completely turning his back on God. 10. Because of this, I'm going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns dung until it is all gone. In other words, it's not just your son who's going to die. Your whole household, all the men, in Jeroboam's household will pass away. There will be none to replace them. His family will be gone forever. They are a filthy, vile, unrepenting bunch. And God doesn't want him, he doesn't want any of them on his planet anymore. 11. Dogs will eat those belonging to Jeroboam who die in the city. The birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. The Lord has spoken. Jeroboam's wife and Jeroboam, they have their answer. And it's not good. It was a very disgraceful thing in those days to not have a decent burial. To have your dead body eaten by animals or birds was one way God was saying, you don't belong to me. And I, don't, and I don't want you because you didn't want me. And it was his way of saying that with an exclamation point. 12. As for you, go back home. When you set foot in your city, the boy will die. I suppose she could avoid going home, hoping that her son would not die. But she would not dare play with God like that. Not after getting this message from the prophet she would not dare play with God 
Because if she knows anything at this point, she knows that God plays hardball. Her son will die. And her walking into town will help it happen. Just like her idolatry and her husband's idolatry helped bring it about. They are partially responsible for the death of their own child. 13. All Israel will mourn for him and bury him. He is the only one belonging to Jeroboam who will be buried because he is the only one in the house of Jeroboam in whom the Lord, the God of Israel, has found anything good. And so God noticed something good about that son of theirs. I guess he was not a, an idolater like the rest, like his parents. Maybe he was too young. He might be the only one in the family who didn't go to hell. Verse 14. The Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who will cut off the family of Jeroboam. This is the day. What? Yes, even now. In other words, judgment has begun. But the death of this son and the pain of of, of these parents is just the beginning of the judgment. Soon there's not going to be anyone left from the household of Jeroboam. 15. And the Lord will strike Israel so that it will be like a reed swaying in the water. He will uproot Israel from this good land that he gave to their forefathers and scatter them beyond the river because they provoked the Lord to anger by making Asherah poles. And just remember, when God mentions the name Israel here in verse 15, it refers to the ten northern tribes. And the whole works was guilty of idolatry. And so their destruction is on the way. The entire northern nation will be taken into captivity eventually. The people up there could have gone against their king and refused to worship his idols. No, it wouldn't have been easy. Maybe they would have even paid for it with their lives, but they could have obeyed God. But they didn't. So now they're going to pay for their sins, just like the king. 16. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, because of the sins Jeroboam has committed, and caused Israel to commit. So they were all guilty. Jeroboam sinned by establishing his golden calves and by his example his bad example he led others up north into the same sin and now they're all going to be punished because they all did it of their own free will he did not have to sin and they did not have to follow him nobody ever said obedience was easy right? God certainly never said it. Then Jeroboam's wife got up and left and went to Terzah. As soon as she stepped over the threshold of the house, the boy died. Just exactly as God said. Can you imagine what a horrible trip home this was for this mother? Sure, she was an ungodly woman, but she definitely still cared about her son. She helped slay her son with her idolatry and God drove that point home to her right here because when she entered the door he passed away verse 18 they buried him and all Israel mourned for him as the Lord had said through his servant the prophet Ahijah so the young boy or However old he was, he got a decent burial, like God said he would. And I don't know if it means anything to this mother. Probably not. But she should find some comfort knowing that her son appeared to be right with God. Went to paradise to be with God. But she won't find any comfort in that because she is not right with God herself. What good does it do her if her son is in heaven? She'll never see him again. She's burning in hell. You see, that's that's one of the problems with with rejecting Christ. 
a family member, a loved one, a friend, may die in Christ and go to heaven, and that's wonderful, but there's no comfort for the one who's left behind if they don't know Christ. (laughs) There's no comfort. They'll never see Him again. Unless they repent themselves. It's all over. Death is a dead end. And worse. Verse 19. The other events of Jeroboam's reign, his wars, and how he ruled, are written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. He reigned for 22 years and then rested with his fathers. And Nadab, his son, succeeded him as king. And now the scene shifts from the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom and its king, Rehoboam. Verse 21. Rehoboam, son of Solomon, was king in Judah. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. The city the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel in which to put his name. His mother's name was Naama. She was an Ammonite. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. He was the son of Solomon who he had with one of his many foreign wives. And so Rehoboam's mother was an idolater. Rehoboam's father, the king, was a compromiser. Tried to serve God and idols at the same time. Rehoboam is a product of a messed up family that's for sure and that's why he was all messed up himself 22 Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord by the sins they committed they stirred up his jealous anger more than their fathers had done the idolatry that Solomon introduced into Israel had a bad influence on the people What a person surrounds themselves with, what they watch and listen to, will influence them. And if it is a bad influence, they will suffer for whatever bad rubs off on them. And so this whole, all this garbage started with Solomon, who tolerated idolatry. And then it spread, and it got worse with the following generations. And it affects real souls. It affected real souls, and real souls went to hell. And it all began by tolerating it. 23. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones and Asherah poles, on every high hill and under every spreading tree. It's just rampant. All these things were a part of idolatry. Judah was a spiritual mess full of the worship of false gods thanks to the tolerant attitude of Solomon who allowed it to get started see what is tolerated in one generation is often abused in the next 24 there were even male shrine prostitutes in the land the people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites and it wasn't just idolatry homosexuality Actually, homosexual acts were part of some of the so-called worship of the idols. It was the filthiest, vilest thing imaginable. God's people were acting like the people that he kicked out of the Holy Land to make room for his people in the days of Joshua. 25. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. See, God's not taking this stuff sitting down God had the southern kingdom on a short leash they were his people he wanted them to repent so he allowed Egypt to attack trying to wake them up if a nation has any spiritual sense at all an attack from outside usually wakes them up spiritually somewhat temporarily if nothing else 26 
he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord, the king of Egypt did, and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. And all these things would have been worth millions, millions of dollars. The wealth of Israel is beginning to whittle away. The blessings of God do not always disappear completely and immediately from his backsliding people. Most of the time it's a slow whittling away. And then the people usually wake up at some point. They say, you know what? I just noticed something. Things are not nearly as good as what they used to be a few years ago. Life does not have the joy that it once had. What happened? Well, you walked away from God. Yeah, but it was good for a while. Yeah, sure, it was good for a while. Because the blessings are not always removed completely right away. 27. Actually, 26. He carried off... No, sorry, 27. It says, So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned these to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance of the royal palace. Idolatry replaced God, consequently bronze was replacing gold. The blessings of God are disappearing. Bronze was cheap and durable. So the king replaced the gold shields which were taken away by Egypt with these bronze ones. At least they were serviceable. Israel is losing the wealth and the blessing. God gave them because Israel has lost God. 28. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards bore the shields, and afterwards they returned them to the guardroom. Why is that king going to the Lord's temple anyway? That's what I want to know. Looks like he attempted to at least go through the motions of serving God, but of course God did not buy it because he was serving idols also. And to serve God, a person must have a heart for God. The Bible says you cannot have two masters. Verse 29. As for the other events of Rehoboam's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? And there was continual warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, between the north and the south. There was, a, there was never all-out war between the north and the south. And God would not allow that. However, there were constant skirmishes. That's because neither one of them were walking with the Lord. There is unity with people who are sold out to God. But when people are led by their own desires, or what they think is right, there's bound to be division, problems. 31. And Rehoboam rested with his fathers and was buried with them in the city of David. His mother's name was Naama. She was an Ammonite. And Abijah, his son, succeeded him as king. Again, God mentions that Rehoboam's mother was not a Hebrew. That's just the second time he mentioned that in this chapter. He's trying to drive that home. Solomon married an unbeliever. Exactly what God told Israel not to do. And you see the results of it. I'll say it again. I will never, ever perform a marriage ceremony between a Christian and a non-Christian. I don't care. I won't do it, ever. No exceptions, period. God is crystal clear about that. So, a backslidden father and a heathen mother produced Rehoboam. Sure can produce this messed up son. And when that son is in leadership, it leads to a whole lot of messed up stuff, like a messed up country. 